Uh, good morning, bonjour. Uh, my name is Beth Chitekwebiti. I'll be moderating this session um, from Slum Dwellers International, and we're based in Cape Town. So you will see on the slide um, a run up of our agenda today. Uh, it is my uh, privilege to moderate uh, this uh, session. Um, we are here to explore different approaches for making sure that uh, local actors can take uh, a key role in adaptation. Uh, as SDI, we work in, um, with, in informal settlements and slums, and um, communities of the urban poor adapt as a matter of course. They, they have no choice in the matter. If there's flooding, they have to find ways to to resolve that. If there are fires, they have to find a way to resolve that. So, and the same occurs for uh, fisher folk or communities or pastoralists are living with uh, the impact of climate change. A big issue around the global discourse currently is how we take adaptation to the local level to enhance and scale up the initiatives that are occurring. These dialogues are being uh, organized by ENDA, IIED, the Wairo Commission. Um, I'm sorry if I'm leaving another organization, but this is a collective of organizations that are committed to local led adaptation and we are taking part in these dialogues to ensure that we accentuate the voice to practically use the principles of local led adaptation that have been developed over the last uh, year. We will have uh, keynote addresses. Uh, we will have breakout sessions where we will be able to discuss enablers and, uh, and uh, issues that um, challenge local led adaptation. We hopefully will be able to uh, find an opportunity to discuss what we see is uh, the, the, the next uh, uh, steps. We are fortunate that we have uh, Miss Alicia Herbert, who is the Special Envoy for Gender and Equity from the United Kingdom, uh, Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs uh, Development Office to give us um, our keynote address. Uh, she will focus on a spotlight on Africa and the work that the UK government is doing and committing to this process. Um, I, I would like to just check if Alicia is now available so we can uh, start. Beth, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. And uh, welcome. Okay, so. And thank you very much. It's uh, great to meet you. Uh, the spotlight is on you. Please uh, go ahead. Thank <laughs> okay, you. thank you very much. And I've been here all along listening to, you know, your introduction um, to the session. And, you know, it is, uh, you know, good day, good morning, you know, wherever you are in the world. Um, you know, friends and colleagues, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking uh, as part of this regional dialogue on locally led uh, participation and adaptation. In my role as a UK Special Envoy for Gender Equality, and indeed throughout my career in development, I've had the privilege of learning about the experiences of people and communities around the world who are at the forefront of climate change. Climate-related disasters and increasingly uh, unpredictable weather events 
are having a profound and often devastating impact on the lives and livelihoods, ecosystems and economies around the world. As we all know, as you all know, uh, there is a wealth of knowledge held in local communities, held by local communities, by women, by young people, by indigenous people, which is vital for successful dealing, successfully dealing with these impacts, combining tradition with innovation to build resilience. And this group heard a number of inspiring case studies at the first series of these regional dialogues in September, focusing on successful examples of peer-to-peer -peer capacity building, devolved decision-making, support for Indigenous-led action, and promotion of innovative practices, to name just a few areas. We know that progress is already being made across the world. However, there's a limit to what can be achieved without the necessary enabling environment. And so we, as the international community, must do more to help support and drive effective adaptation on the ground. And this is, criti this is a critical aim of the UK's COP presidency. This requires amplifying the voices of those who are not often heard and making local community agents of change. This requires change across all levels of society and across the development finance infrastructure and architecture. We must prioritize locally led adaptation in decision making and implementation so that marginalized people and communities are empowered to protect their own future and finance is accessible to those who need it most. We must learn from approaches like the LDC Initiative for Effective Adaptation and Resilience, the Life AR program, of which the UK is a supporter. And that program recognizes that countries, local communities, organizations and authorities are the experts in informing the decisions on how to prepare for climate change in their own context. The Life AR is focused on supporting countries to develop tailored financial mechanisms to channel ultimately up to 70% of all climate funds to local levels. With Fiji and other partners, the UK presidency launched a task force on access to climate finance to align programmatic support behind national plans and improve access to climate finance flows. The task force will develop a set of principles and recommendations to underpin and to guide the new approaches to access with climate finance providers and recipients encouraged to sign up by the time of COP26. The way in which we undertake research and use of evidence must also change. For example, the Adaptation Research Alliance is seeking to catalyze a paradigm shift so that research responds to local needs, focuses on action and informs decision making. The Alliance will seek to strengthen collaboration between Southern led local organizations and the Global North to enhance capacity building. We encourage all of those engaged in building our collective knowledge base to endorse the Alliance's results-oriented adaptation research principles. In making locally-led adaptation a central priority of the COP presidency, we not only want to amplify the calls for greater support for locally-led action, but to also address the barriers that restrict and prevent finance flowing to the local level. COP26 in November, just a few weeks away, provides an, an, a, a fantastic opportunity, a key opportunity to amplify the importance of locally led adaptation, to share lessons about progress already made, and to bring together donors, SIDS and LDCs on this agenda. We must ensure momentum is continued into the African COP27 presidency and beyond. And so I look forward to continuing to work together to champion this crucial agenda. Huge thanks for the opportunity to address this group this morning. Uh, thank you. And I pass back to you now. I think, thank you very much, um, Alicia. It's um, you, for, for all of us here, these are really critical and uh, I, I want to use a a, a a euphemism almost like music to our ears to 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 um to to understand uh, the position of the uk government around local lead adaptation we will move uh so thank you very much we will move forward uh with our next speaker uh who is ineza grace umohoza I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your, your name properly. She's the founder and CEO of Green Fighter and co-director of Loss and Damage Youth Foundation. 
Ines, we are so thrilled that you could join us. Uh, the spotlight is on you. Please uh, go ahead with your address. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can I please confirm that you can hear me clearly? Because I have a very funny mic. We can hear you clearly. Uh, can people just put thumbs up to, to inform uh, Grace that you can hear her? Great. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to start by thanking you for the invitation. It is important to ensure that uh, in the locally led adaptation, youth and women, especially from the Gobo South voices, are included. For this, I would like to thank the organizers of the event, um, to name a few, um, and the Energy Horiado Commission. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly the International Institute for Environment and Development, Sam Durs International, South South North, and others who made this possible. <clears throat> Global South community did less to contribute to the current climate change, but yet we are at the front line to experience the negative impact of climate change. Communities, organization, youth groups, local leaders, at the front line of the climate change and the so-called natural crisis have both the first-hand information and knowledge on how to cope. But we are not part of the decision-making process. And this is exactly what the principle of locally-led adaptation, which will be touched on in more detail shortly at today's dialogue, is looking to address. To showcase and scale up innovative funding and governance models that enable locally led adaptation. My name is Ineza and Beth, you did, you did the, uh, pronounce it correctly. Ineza come from uh, a Rwandan, in Kenya Rwandan language and it means kindness. I am an impact driven, self-motivated eco-feminist in the climate change sector, serving the global community based in Uganda. My country is small, but yet beautiful, located in Africa, our economic development is vulnerable and exposed to the negative effect of, of the climate change. For example, in the rural area, three in five people rely on agriculture as the main source of economic de development. Rain-fed agriculture is the most common. Associated with our amazing mountain, this sector is highly vulnerable to a slight increase of rainfall intensity or the rain scarcity. In 2020 alone, alone, despite the challenge of uh, living in the COVID pandemic, we lost more than 4,000 hectares of crop. This is not something that we want to see being a, no a normality because women and children uh, and also youth are the, more, are the most vulnerable. It is common, it's a common reality in most developing country where flooding, drought, erosion, cyclone, heat wave, and so many more are most of the reality check of our community. Today, even developed countries are exposed to, but we are neither hopeless nor without a solution. Frontline community developed resilience as a coping measure and have diverse approaches. With the right attention, consideration, and especially with the non tokenistic inclusion, they can help our planet regenerate faster. Locally led adaptation is one of the effective means because the local actors understand the full scope of the context which make it easier for them to generate innovation and creativity. But the access of finance for the locally led adaptation is challenging not only for youth, but also for countries too, especially developing ones. That is why today's dialogue on the law to COP26 is so important for highlighting the need for locally led adaptation and identifying the changes that we need to the system to be making. Locally led adaptation means tangible hope for the community to achieve resilience by coping to the negative effect of climate change, while also striving for the social, health, and economic sector development of our community. The Great Green World uh, is one of the examples that come in mind. 
community in the Sahel region are able to have access to food, technology, and economic development while also building their climate resilience. These and other similar initiatives need to be strengthened, shared, and scaled around and shared around the world. The UNFCC COP26 is coming in a few weeks. The gap of locally led adaptation leads to loss and damage. Loss and damage is what happens when it is too late to either mitigate or adapt to climate change impact. And the past climate inaction of global leaders leads to have a full range of loss and damage that is currently our reality. And to us, especially the youth, we call it the most uh, climate injustice of our generation. Loss and damage Loss and damage is the most injustice we are facing. So we want loss and damage to be a priority at COP26 and beyond. And we also want to see more action on the ground. And the locally led adaptation is one way to ensure this. Today, we have all come together, united by our interest and passion on locally led adaptation. And it is important that we clear on what our COP26 ask is for lo locally led adaptation. Is it more endorsement of the principle and stronger commitment to implementation? Is it calling on loss and damage and loss locally led adaptation as specific for COP26 by the incoming African presidency? Is it the fund of one trillion billion fund dedicated to support the local led adaptation? I look forward to hear more on your ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ines, for such an inspiring uh, conversation and uh, making time to, to join us. Um, uh, for me, the greatest uh, take from your uh, speech is that we are not hopeless. We do have solutions and, and ultimately what we are seeking is that those solutions be scaled up to address the challenges that are currently being faced. Thank you so much. And um, it is uh, lovely to have you uh, with us. Uh, we would like to do a, a quick exercise uh, so that everyone gets warmed to discuss the actions that are needed uh, to um, address uh, locally led adaptation to scale. Uh, this exercise is called a chat shower. We have two questions. For each question, we would like you to type your response in the chat, but don't hit send yet. Uh, this requires um, this requires discipline. Uh, we, we, I've been I've had this done before, and you you do get people that who hit send before it's uh, uh, time. So please. Be very disciplined. Uh, hold on to your to your responses. Uh, the first question that we would like to ask is, what is your biggest hope for the for local led adaptation at COP twenty six? I would like just to read a couple uh, from from Dr. Mustafa Solomon. Uh, he mentions plantation. Marek says US 1 billion funds committed to local led adaptation. Oh, we really hope that happens, Marek. More finance from Helen. Uh, Monita says direct funding to local organizations. And uh, Jessica Masira says devolved resources to communities and grassroots. Thank you, everyone. Uh, these are amazing uh, answers. We will move to the next one. Same, uh, hold it and discipline, please. Uh, what changes would you like to see to scale locally led adaptation? From clear, flexible and patient finance, from INESA funding, from Vincent, national government committing to locally led adaptation. Uh, from George, increased inclusion for local voices. From Jessica again, 
uh, networks implementations from Awesha flexible and patient finance. Patient finance, I think that's absolutely critical because often uh, when finance is made available, it is it has a timelines that local communities might not be able to to uh, meet. From Francis, peer learning and best practices from local groups. Fantastic! Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, keep them go rolling if you have if something comes to you. Uh, but before we head uh, into our breakout groups, we have a, pre a presentations on the principles of locally led adaptation and the pathways for delivering this. I would like to introduce my colleague Ariana Karamalis uh, from Slum Dwellers International Secretariat here in Cape Town and Marek Soms from the Institute of International Development to begin their presentation. Ariana and Marek, over to you. Thanks so much, Beth. So I'm gonna hand over to Ariana in one second. I'm just going to give you uh, for the benefit of possibly having many new people here today, new faces who were not at the first dialogue. Um, we just wanted to give a quick recap about the project that you're joining uh, us on this discussion today. Before I hand over to Ariana, who's going to give you a recap of the discussion that happened at the first dialogue. So from my side at IID, again, thank you for joining us today. It's fantastic to see so many faces and the opening keynote and the introduction from the UK was absolutely fantastic. And Nazia's intro and the importance of representing youth and women voices in this is so important. So thank you for joining this. And um, second dialogue is part of a series and a project called Scaling Up Local Led Adaptation that is being supported by the COP26 presidency, the Adaptation Action Coalition and the Race to Resilience. And as Beth mentioned, is a collaboration across 10 organizations across Africa, Asia Pacific and the Caribbean. And the real focus of this is on trying to scale up support for state and non-state action on local led adaptation to identify what are the pathways to replicate and scale up and support the approaches or mechanisms for really getting uh, local led adaptation at scale across, across Asia Pacific, Africa, the Caribbean and Latin America. And we undertook the first series of dialogues in early September, and many of you joined that, and we hope that we'll recap on what the key points in the discussion are. And today, we're really delving deep on what are the enablers and the changes required to really support uh, the journey, progress on the journey, the pathway towards more local led adaptation, and to further identify what are the changes and the big asks at COP26 that we need to be putting forward to really initiate a, a, an actual systemic change. Um, and we'll hope to provide a bit of an, uh, a notice to this um, at the end of the presentation about this. This is not the end of the conversation. We'll be having uh, discussions over the next couple of days tomorrow in Asia Pacific and on Thursday in Latin America, Caribbean. We'll be sharing all the keynotes that come out of this, but also be having various events at COP26 and beyond. So we're really looking forward to continuing this discussion. And uh, next slide, please, Ebony. Now, um, just before I hand over to Ariana, um, we, in the first set of dialogues, covered 11 amazing stories from across Africa, Asia Pacific and Latin America, Caribbean, the green case studies that you see on your slides, and we're in the process of developing further stories. Um, I was originally going to give you a bit of a background on all those 11 stories, but just to quickly run through them, and I will do after Ariana's presentation, included small granting in South Africa, utilizing decentralization in Kenya, social protection in India, um, non-governmental funding in Micronesia and the Caribbean, microfinance in Costa Rica, all these examples. And we'll provide a bit more background on those stories after Ariana's given you a bit of a background and a recap about what happened in the first dialogue and a, another recap on the eight principles for local led adaptation. So thank you very much for joining, but now I'll hand over to Ariana to give you a bit of that recap. Thanks so much. Thank you, Marek. Over to you, Ariana. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Marek. Um, I'm Ariana Karamalis from SDI. Um, and yeah, those 11 case studies that Marek just went over briefly um, 
provides such great examples of delivering um, against the eight principles for locally led adaptation, which I'm just gonna review for everybody now. Um, Ebony, can you, thank you so much. So as a reminder for all of us, um, I'm just gonna go over those quickly. You'll see that each one has been matched with related case studies on the slides for your information. So I'm not gonna read through all the case studies, but it can help you kind of see how the various case studies, you know, relate to the different principles. So the eight principles for locally led adaptation that we're all here to discuss and, and look at more closely. The first one, devolving decision-making to the lowest appropriate level. The second one, addressing structural inequalities faced by women, youth, children, disabled, displaced, indigenous peoples, and marginalized ethnic groups. Number three, providing patient and predictable funding that can be accessed more easily. Number four, investing in local capabilities to leave an institutional legacy. And we can move on to number five through eight. Number five, building a robust understanding of climate risk and uncertainty. Number six, flexible programming and learning. Number seven, ensure transparency and accountability. And number eight, collaborative action and investment. So those are the eight principles that are kind of, you know, that we're, we're framing everything around really for, for today and for the previous um, dialogue. And then if we can go to the next slide, we're just gonna kind of highlight for, for those who were there or those who were not there, some of the headlines that came out of that first series of dialogue. So the first one, which came up in the chat shower earlier was the US uh, $1 billion fund call that came from Diane Black Lane at one of the previous dialogues um, for a locally led adaptation fund um, that could spe specifically fund locally led actions through NGOs and civil society groups. Another one was um, the need for devolved decision-making and that that should be entrenched in governance models. Voices from the ground need to be consistently included to keep responses agile and responsive. Locally led adaptation funding time horizons need to be longer. And that was also brought up in the chat showers with the need for patient finance, as it was put. Um, and that, you know, it takes several years to establish innovative local governance models and to get that funding to the local level. Um, local people's time needs to be acknowledged rather than part assuming that they can participate for free. Um, informal sector is underfunded despite possessing robust approaches and offering opportunities for scaling up LLA approaches. Um, the communities and local organizations shouldn't be the ones bearing the financial risk. Despite that, they're having to jump through onerous loops designed for you know, big international organizations. And local, traditional, and indigenous groups provide trust and networks that are required and needed to deliver effective locally led adaptation based on understanding the local political economy and possessing established networks, understanding the surrounding natural environment. So those are some of the big headlines that came out of that first dialogue. Um, as a reminder to those of us who were there and as a um, kind of you know, note for those who maybe couldn't have made it. And then um, if we have time, we just kind of wanted to highlight also the next slide points out some of the key questions that arose out of that dialogue as well that can help us to deepen LLA delivery mechanisms and the, the um, eight principles. So the first one was, are intermediaries needed for supporting this work? You know, a lot of these funds are really big um, and maybe too, too large to go directly to the local level. So is there a need for suitable, better intermediaries um, that are more connected and accountable to local levels? Number two, how are excluded people actually involved and supported in decision-making um, and especially highlighting people with disabilities? Number three, how are local people and organizations supported to build resilience to longer term and more extreme climate change? So scenario planning can be a really useful tool, but sometimes it's quite difficult to incorporate in practice. Um, number four, what is the role of the local private sector in delivering locally led adaptation and what are the possible trade-offs? So those are some of the key questions that came out and maybe we can bring some of those into our breakout groups later. Thanks everyone. And I think with that, I will hand back over to, oh, right. So yes, if you have any questions about what I just presented um, or what Marek spoke about, you can pop those in the chat and um, I will hand back over to you, Beth. Thanks so much. Um, uh, thank you, Ariana. Um, I noticed that we have had uh, a couple of um, people that have uh, entered um, the dialogue. Just to remind uh, 
our French speaking colleagues that if you can uh, preface your, your names uh, with FR, we will be able to uh, uh, facilitate that you are put in a group where there is either translation or for or French speaking. Um, what our next uh, process is to go into breakout uh, groups. What uh, we have is about uh, 30 minutes, but I think we have uh, been quite um, efficient with time. So we might be able to have slightly uh, more time uh, where we would like a chance to discuss uh, questions we've already started to reflect on through the chat shower, as well as uh, Marek and uh, Ariana's uh, presentations. And uh, we have uh, three key uh, discussion questions, uh, which- I think, I think we have a quick, uh, just a quick overview of uh, the LLA local ed adaptation pathways before the breakouts. Okay, all right, minutes. thank you, Marek. Sorry, I'm in a rush to go, go to the breakout groups. Could we have that next? Thank you. No problem, Beth, thanks so much. Um, so apologies, you have to hear my voice for another 10 minutes uh, before we can hear all of your voices. Um, apologies. Um, so thanks so much, Beth, and thanks, Ariana, for that fantastic recap. Um, so what we want to do, um, just present before we get into the breakout discussion, was um, recapping on the first dialogue. There was some fantastic discussion um, from these 11 case studies, but also what are the of enabling conditions, the changes that need to happen, what needs to happen within the external environment to really support more of these um, innovative, uh, what we call local adaptation delivery mechanisms, others, as Ariane referred to, good intermediaries, as we just wanted to recap these concepts to really get your, your, in, your innovative ideas firing as we prepare for the breakout group. So what this slide should show, so an error on our side, is it should uh, be about explaining well what are the what are the pathways to local led adaptation? So Ebony, next slide, please. So as um, Ariana referred to, um, and if you were at the first dialogue, you would have heard this concept of delivery mechanisms. Now, maybe just to cut through the jargon, this is an IID term that uh, well, it's not just IID; it's been used now by the least developed countries group in the. Um, uh, initiative for effective adaptation and resilience, but what does it mean? Basically, what it means is, as Ariana referred to, do we need intermediate? Do we need intermediaries? The funding is often very big and very distributed. Local actors have their own savings. So, how do we deliver local-led adaptation at scale? So often, and one of the key solutions is better intermediaries, not relying on the current top-down in international institutions that don't exist within the countries or not connected. To the communities at the front line, but intermediaries who are at the national or subnational level from across the whole of society, from government, civil society, private sector, that are better connected and can channel international, national finance to the local level, can help aggregate local funding and can facilitate inclusive local led adaptation. So, what are these approaches and how can we support them to be the core delivery of climate finance? shifting from a business as usual where top-down intermediaries, international development banks, UN agencies are the prime deliverer, delivery of adaptation support, where country institutions and local institutions are leading the whole process, are able to provide climate-informed advice, help communities understand the climate science, provide a platform for rapid learning, and are embedded within an institution that are sustainable over the timeframes we're going to have to deal with climate change. As, as has been previously said, it's going to take decades to build resilience, not a few years. We need institutions in place that are sustainable politically and have the networks on the ground. So next slide, please. So in the first dialogue, we heard from 11 fantastic case studies. So just to, to remind you of those stories that we heard, we heard from the South Africa Community Adaptation Small Grants Facility, a collaboration between Sandy and South South North that is providing small grants directly to local CSOs to invest in adaptation in their livelihoods, to support resilient agriculture and improve the resilience of their human settlements. We heard from Kenya, 
a case that is using that decentralization structure to scale up local county climate change funds from across seven to 45 counties with the support of the World Bank and many other donors to deliver public good investments, particularly in supporting pastoralism and agricultural resilience. From grassroots led approaches, we heard from the Gungano Fund in Zimbabwe, helping to aggregate urban poor's own savings that can provide capital grants to sustainable slum upgrading and deliver amazing results for the urban poor with moderate resources. We heard from an approach in Namibia, the Environment Investment Fund, one of the most successful at in accessing international climate finance, providing a, a range of grants and loans to local CSOs, local government and local private sector organisations, but particularly in natural resource management. Moving to Asia, we had the Climate Bridge Fund in Bangladesh, providing direct grants to Bangladeshi NGOs, particularly in the context of climate-induced migration, covering five city corporations. And we had local on-granting in the Pacific with the Micronesia Conservation Trust, providing small grants to, uh, that are based around the local context and connecting local actors with international funding. We had another grassroots example from the Yakum Emergency Unit in Indonesia, that is working with the Huara Commission to provide direct grants to women's led organizations and helping them connect with the, the progressive decentralization structure in Indonesia. We had another large scale example of the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in Orissa, utilizing the country's wide scale social protection scheme to help provide climate resilient wages, shock responsive cash transfers and resilient assets and improving local people's climate knowledge. We had a global example of a global fund for indigenous peoples from the Pawanka Fund that's providing direct grants to indigenous, indigenous peoples organizations and another civil society on granting approach with the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Fund in the Caribbean supported by Canary, providing long-term funding directly to CSOs led by women, youth and indigenous peoples. And finally, in Costa Rica, we had the Fund de Corporación, a private foundation providing direct microfinance and credit facilities to small MSMEs and CBOs tailoring that with climate information. So we provided all these great stories and, we're, and the ones in orange, we're developing videos and stories on currently. We didn't have time to finalize these for the second dialogue, but we will share these in the coming days and coming weeks. So we're collecting all these stories and we'd love to hear from the many stories and delivery mechanisms for really facilitating local-led adaptation that you're aware of. So what we thought about is, um, to try and make sense of all these different approaches. And one of the key messages we heard from is it's not just about the government or state leading these or the private sector or civil society. It's also about the collaborations that happen between all three. Could you click next please, Tanya? So we tried to map all of these out and really what we started to emerge is a fantastic array of collaborations and different approaches, the diversity of approaches that are possible to deliver and facilitate local-led adaptation. As we've already mentioned, that includes utilizing decentralization in Kenya, utilizing social protection schemes in India, a range of national climate funds or small community grant facilities in South Africa, in Namibia, grassroots-led approaches being incredibly important. Often these are termed frontline funds, really mobilizing the voices and the action and the resources and savings from civil society and grassroots organizations at the front line of climate change in Zimbabwe and Indonesia and across the globe. And the opportunity to provide microfinance and credit facilities that really can su support sustainable livelihoods. A huge range of approaches. So the key questions we wanna to ask today, next slide please, Amy, is thinking about, well, what are the pathways? What are the journeys that can support the progress or advancement of these types of approaches? Now, Delivery mechanisms for local adaptation aren't the only important criteria. We have a surrounding enabling environment that these local-led adaptation delivery mechanisms work within that are incredibly important for supporting their journey from, for instance, in the grassroots examples, starting with their collective action, with their, working with their own savings, accessing other sources of funding like philanthropy, bilateral finance, even towards the end, like Namibia and Micronesia and Fund de accessing mature sources of climate finance like the Green Climate Fund and the Adaptation Fund. So the first question we're going to go into the breakouts today is, well, what are the enablers and the changes that are required to move along this pathway, to move along this journey 
for delivering local led adaptation? What are the key things that have supported these changes to happen? Sorry, the scale up and replication of local led adaptation to happen. What are the key changes that need to take place to better support it? And finally, and next, what, are, what does international climate finance need to do or other sources of finance need to do to better support this journey along this pathway? And what should be the key asks for COP26? Now, you've already started to think about these key asks in the chat shower that happened at the start of this uh, dialogue. But we really want you to kind of think, can we start to nail down what should be the real key asks that we're taking forward? Now, is it that we need more pilot or innovation finance, really risky finance that can invest in very novel and new local led adaptation approaches? Is it finance that can be provided incredibly patiently over five, 10, 15 years to really support the development and the nourishment and the mentorship of these types of approaches? And is it finance to really scale up these approaches, take them nationwide, take them across wider approaches? It may be all three. Where is it that we need more of this and who are the donors that can really support this to happen? So maybe just to whet your appetite a bit, I'm not providing you with a whole lot of examples, but some of the enablers that might get you thinking is, uh, do they need these approaches need local presence? How long do they need to be embedded within the local or national uh, context for? Do they have local networks? Who might these be? What supporting policy and regulation can really support the journey along this local led adaptation pathway? What kind of capabilities need to be built? Many of these approaches had bespoke financing approaches tailored for local actors. What are the key features of making these approaches work for their local constituents? Do they need to have committed domestic resources? Where do these come from, particularly in contexts where there are little discretionary funding at national and local levels? Who are the donors that are going to step forward and take these bigger risks in novel approaches and to really incubate and mentor these different types of local-led adaptation delivery mechanisms? And what are the changes required? Do we need more patient funding? How long do we need this funding to be for? How can we strengthen these approaches to really help communities deal with the more extreme and longer term climate risks that are going to escalate over the next coming years and decades? Who do collaborations need to happen with? And as they grow and develop, what kind of institutional strengthening needs to happen? In what areas do we need to develop these? And what might be the trade-offs to achieving those eight principles that Ariana presented as these approaches develop, deliver more finance, achieve greater scale. And finally, how, from learning from the first dialogue and the cases that we presented, how could we even further reflect across our own networks to improve the approaches and stories that we've heard to deliver even more inclusive and more locally led adaptation? So I hope those ideas just start to whet your appetite and stimulate some ideas for the breakouts, and I think. That's the end of my presentation. Ebony, if you could go to the next slide. Yeah, so that's the end. Uh, so I think I'll now hand over to Beth. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions before we go into the breakouts. So now, very much over to the breakouts with you, Beth. Thank you, uh, Marek. Um, so we, we will divide the breakout uh, sessions uh, by language. Please uh, try and uh, have a look at uh, a group that is uh, less people, so we have uh, a balance of our discussion in each of the breakout uh, groups. There will be facilitators. We have Aisha, Marek, Christina, Ebony, Claire, Emmanuel, Samson, and George. Uh, but each group will need to agree on someone who will report back some critical uh, discussions back to the plenary. Just uh, to repeat those questions uh, that Marek uh, uh, spoke of again, we are looking at three key questions. What are the enablers and changes required for progress to local led adaptation? How can international climate finance better support locally led adaptation? And what would be your one ask uh, for COP26? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can we go into the groups now? We have 30 minutes. Um, uh, yes, we do have 30 minutes, maybe slightly more, but let's see. It would be good to have some more time for discussion but we can go into the breakout session again. Okay, 
Um, assuming we are all back in the main room, we've lost some participants in the meantime, uh, but uh, welcome back. I hope you had a very interesting and engaged conversations um, and that you each, in each of the groups, you have someone who is prepared to make a presentation. The way we're going to do it is uh, rather than have everyone present on the same question, I'll be asking groups one and two, I, I hope you remember which group you were in, to specifically speak to what is one change needed for national government systems to uh, support, no, no, sorry, uh, I, I need to go back to my, Yes, um, so for groups one and two, um, I would like you to focus on uh, what, what, what is one change needed for national government system to support locally led um, adaptation that stood out from, for you from your group discussions. All right, um, so could I ask uh, group one, to speak to the changes needed by national government systems to support locally led adaptation. Thanks, Beth. Um, that was our group and Arnold was um, going to report back for our group. So Arnold, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So one, one aspect that came out uh, of our discussion, uh, just to mention one, uh, we had very brilliant ideas coming, but for the sake of the discussion and to save time, what came out strongly is um, uh, the need for government um, to sort of increase their location uh, towards locally uh, led adaptation from their, you know, a public um, exchequer or from, you know, from their budgets, because uh, this will entice or this will even, you know, promote um, or even bring about ownership at, at at national level. So apart from global ask around um, the issue of uh, increasing ad adaptation fund at national level, we felt governments, if they can increase their investments or their budgetary allocations um, to locally led adaptation uh, um, actions, then this will spur uh, and encourage more of, of these um, initiatives. So I'll, 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 I'll leave there because you asked for one. Uh, I think it's in order. Thank you very much, Arnold. Uh, can we move to group two, uh, which was being facilitated by Marek? Uh, and could you talk to what stood out from your group discussion on one change needed for international climate finance to support locally led adaptation? So this so, is group two. Yeah, for international climate finance. Um, changes, we had a huge amount of ideas. Now, unfortunately, it's me reporting back, so I didn't do a good job of asking for nominations, as per usual. Um, but um, so to summarise some fantastic discussion, I'll have to try and pick one. <coughs> so I guess the main area that we really um, emphasised, to put it in a nutshell, was the need for international climate finances to shift from this project mode and um, building one-off capacities to really building institutional capacities and um, so the capacity of local institutions that are the institutions there that are there to facilitate and support local led adaptation to take place and build local capacities to facilitate and I, one of the ideas for doing this just to put on an idea was potentially uh, the, the need for those organizations that currently dominate much of the knowledge so for instance uh, your international consultancies like pwc um, and other organizations like that are often brought in to build capacity and often benefit from local knowledge and improve their reputations from local knowledge to change the way that they operate and to supporting in-kind um, um, support, really utilizing their capacities in project and financial management and helping local organizations to build those skills. Um, but we really, really need to rethink the model that it's not um, interna always international in inverted commas, experts, they're the ones that hold the right knowledge and the ones who should be trusted to deliver that kind of capacity building. So we really, really need to rethink how international climate finance is used to build local capacity because it's currently not done in a way 
that properly builds local institutions or overcomes that trust issue with international climate finances. We really need to reshape that model. Um, incentivize anyone in my group to add to that if they wish. Um, but that's kind of guess the big take home um, that I took from my group, but many other comments I'm sure we can add over the course of this report back. Uh, thank you very much, Marek. Uh, we, because we have um, less groups than um, we had anticipated to have in the report back, we, we have slightly more uh, time. So for uh, group uh, seven, uh, uh, Samson and Ebony were facilitating could you speak to um, the fact that we, we know there are challenges to making some of these changes? Um, in your group, did you have any ideas on how to address these um, conditions that need to change, whether it is at the local level, at uh, local authority, city government, uh, national government, or at the international level, but also feel free to uh, talk to some of the earlier uh, points uh, that uh, have already been discussed, uh, if you have any points that you would like to make. So what are the challenges to making some of these changes? Um, Samson and Ebony? Look, we had a really great discussion in our breakout. I think looking at the the kind of enablers and changes, a lot of our discussion was focused around accountability, um, both kind of accountability of the international and national level, but allowing further accountability at the local level too. So we talked a bit about um, opportunities for that. We didn't so much get into solutions, um, but we identified that sort of tackling that accountability issue as a critical point. Um, Samson, I don't know if you want to come in off the back of that or if I should keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah, sure. I, I mean, absolutely. I think accountability came out quite strongly in a lot of what we were talking about. And um, I think one of the key things that we got to establish in just uh, thinking about the various, you know, uh, delivery mechanisms, I think particularly around civil society, I think one of the things that we think was, you know, uh, came out quite strongly was, uh, you know, the need to immerse civil society in the processes in order to build capacities, right? If you're thinking about, um, you know, building, I mean, capacity around accountability and establishing, you know, the necessary frameworks over time. I think it's important to provide civil society with a platform to develop these uh, um, uh, um, capacities, uh, you know, and uh, frameworks, uh, you know, over a period of time and, uh, you know, uh, while collecting data and um, trying to analyze quite critically what worked and what needs to work and, um, you know, how does this appeal to the local context? Perfect. Thanks, Samson. I think that that message around um, the finance is important, but it's not the only thing that is kind of about locally led adaptation came up quite strongly. I think one of the points that stuck out in my mind as well was the point um, around sort of enabling self organization of local groups and local people to engage better to um, build trust, etc, cetera, etc, cetera. building trust, of course, is an issue at, at multiple levels. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of those things that we've just raised came out as areas that can enable locally led adaptation. Great, thank you. Um, did you uh, were there any points that stood out for you, for instance, from uh, what national government systems can do to support um, local led adaptation uh, from your group discussions? Yeah, so from our group discussion, I think the one point that really stood out, which was quite mainly around the way of thinking is that, um, um, we should not think about international finance. If you look at sustainability of local ad adaptation, we should not think about international finance as a you know a sort of a prolonged uh, prolonged funding mechanism. It, we, sh we should think about international finance as a way to uh, as a catalyst to leverage existing domestic resources. And and, and the thinking is that local ad adaptation in the long short. I mean, in the medium to long term, needs to be financed by um, local government. But you know, you need to create the enabling environment and uh, the domestic resource mobilization to create a sustainable process. Great, thank you very much. 
So sorry, please go ahead, Ebony. I was just going to add to Samson's already very clear point that in that context, we talked a lot in the group about um, using maps as part of that um, and kind of bringing a stronger locally led uh, lens to the naps as well. So I think that's part of the part of the national story too. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Um, we will move to group eight, I think, uh, uh, which has, uh, I think, Clara and George were facilitating. And uh, from you, could we look at uh, what your discussion was on in terms of what we can, the asks that we would like to make for COP26 that came from your discussion, but also definitely feel free to, to respond to any of the questions uh, that uh, others have already uh, reported back on. Thank you. Over to you, George and Clara. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I think from our conversation, the main ask which came out of our deliberations had to do uh, with uh, asking for resources, finance. But however, much as finance uh, is critical, we also not noted as a group that there's need to also emphasize on the systems of accessing finance as, a, as another key condition besides just uh, having a big ask around uh, finance. The systems for accessing finance are also equally important. The, then, uh, the big ask from, from our group. We also talked about how do we uh, strengthen abilities, uh, local abilities, uh, and we identified uh, planning in advance as one way through which local actors can maximize uh, climate finance for locally led adaptation. Then secondly, we also talked about uh, uh, generating a board of evidence through collecting uh, data on locally led adaptation experiences as a way of uh, defining in advance priorities that can then inform where the resources then go. And uh, we also talked about, uh, I think it has been shared uh, by other groups, issues of uh, moving from projectized uh, funding to much more strategic funding that is long, long term and uh, as a way of uh, maximizing efficiency in terms of uh, uh, finance. And we, uh, of course, also talked about the need for flexible, flexible finance in, 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 in consistent with the principles of locally led adaptation. And uh, I think we had uh, some discussions around uh, the high levels of accountability and uh, instead of considering it as a bureaucrats people have comfortable with saying there there is need to reflect on the high levels of accountability that are normally placed by donors as a way of making sure that the the resources or the finance are in sync with the local financial architecture that is built uh, by local actors i think uh, my colleagues can add some uh, elements that i may have missed uh, thank you over to you beth uh, Clara, do you have any additional points to make? George captured it all. Oh, there was also um, a discussion um, on how uh, the role of diaspora can be strengthened in, in getting to grips with locally led adaptation and understanding how they can be involved and what are the different routes to start that engagement when there might not be a, a, an easily defined route for how diaspora can be more involved in supporting locally led adaptation. But I think George covered every, every other aspect of our discussion. It was a good group. Great, good. Um, we have uh, a bit of time. I would like uh, to just um, open up to anyone who has uh, a burning uh, uh, question or uh, comment to make that they feel has not been covered in the presentations from the questions that we have. I will put in the 
view so I can see if anyone raised it. Perhaps we can take one or two questions. I see uh, apologies for, for the pronunciation, but Jakamata. I yeah, see. It's okay. It's okay. It's <laughs> okay. It's okay. I, have, I have one observation. Uh, in our group and also prior presentations, uh, extremely focused it has been. One thing which was uh, to me missing has been uh, a documentation of best practices validated by the most uh, you know, endangered population. And how can we do it? We have to use direct and indirect methods. And the last thing I would like to suggest is this. Somehow we are uh, having an impression that the international financial support can only make the local led adaptation. Uh, I'm of the contrary view because you take any nation, it is surviving on external support only. Uh, had only two days back the World Bank report, especially after COVID, each nation is getting dependent more and more on international financial agencies. So what I would like to conclude, I would like to conclude, let us not distinguish between the international support and you know, uh, national support and the local support, et cetera. The situation is very mixed. Case to case, we need to do a need assessment and come to some sort of a specific strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else um, with their hand up? I have a hand up. Can I come in, oh, Beth? Yes, please go ahead. Just to reiterate the two points that I made in the group, which I feel I'd like the group to consider. One is to be able to map the adaptive capacities of the different uh, uh, local uh, organizations so that we are able to showcase that along with the case studies. Because a case study on its own is good, but it's also good if you are able to document what are the assets, capacities, capabilities at the local level that we bring to the table when we ask for external finances as well. So we are not going empty handed to the table. The second point is the national policies to be able to take the national climate policies and to be de demystify them in a language that local groups understand so that local groups can begin to measure and hold their governments accountable because that's not happening today. Thank you very, very much, Celine. Um, Aisha, could you put uh, the, the slide on the uh, next uh, chat shower that we would like uh, to uh, go through just to ensure that everyone kind of like has an opportunity to have a, a last say. Okay, so we are asking you to think of your answer in a few words and then type them in the Zoom chats. Again, don't click send just yet. So what would you, what would be your one ask for COP26 on local led adaptation? On my count of three, so one, two, three, go. Institutional recognition, honored finance commitments, uh, Marek has uh, upped the, the ask to 5 billion for local led adaptation. Invitation to all partners to commit to the principles, patient finance, stronger links between adaptation and nature outcomes. Any more coming in? There is another request for a commitment of 5 billion from Tandy West Strong Climate Finance Architecture that is supportive of local uh, action. From Anuesha, if national government commitment to local led adaptation uh, principles. I didn't participate. From myself, I would like to see the role of local government, not just national government, uh, recognize uh, more and uh, working in partnership with uh, 
and grassroots organizations, from ESTA, demystifying of policies to enable local communities to implement and hold governments accountable. Yes, because accountability almost always seems to be upwards, but never downwards. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for that. You can keep them coming into the chat if you have not had an opportunity um, to um, input your, your thoughts uh, in terms of the ask for COP26. Um, I just want to briefly summarize what my take as a moderator from this uh, dialogue has been. I think we started with two very strong keynote addresses uh, from the Alicia from the FCDO. We got a recognition from the UK government of the importance of local led adaptation, uh, a recognition that knowledge exists uh, at the local level and that governments such as the UK government should be committed to creating access uh, to uh, finance for local led adaptation. We, she talked about the agency and need for a paradigm shift that scale leads to the scaling up of uh, local led adaptation uh, uh, processes that are already ongoing. And uh, she reminded us that uh, COP26 is an opportunity to amplify local led adaptation. Uh, from INESA, we got a strong uh, message that solutions exist. While the challenges exist, solutions exist. And, and for communities in the global south, we have contributed very little or to the challenges of climate change, but we are currently bearing the burden of the impacts of, of that. Uh, she was keen to em emphasize that we are not hopeless or without solutions, um, and that we don't see these solutions as coming from just government, but that uh, young people, women and children have a role to play and they are prepared to make that contribution. In our group discussion, we came up with a number of ideas on how we can actualize local led adaptation. We spoke about the examples that already exist, how these can be scaled up. We spoke about opportunities that are available uh, to do this um, at the local level. I think one aspect that really stood out for me was that while we can request um, whether it's five billion or one billion dollars from the global community, our governments have to be committed to local led adaptation in terms of policies that they policies, but also more importantly, practice. Uh, we talked about the need for flexible fi finance and learning from how accountability can be built to build capacities, but also more importantly, decolonizing knowledge and, and uh, understanding that solutions are not just from coming from, from uh, the global north or from uh, professional organizations that are working in this sector, but that they are also very viable solutions and uh, knowledge at the local level that can be used to 
to scale up local adaptation. Um, I would like to thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and I hope that it was as um, mind changing and uh, interesting for you all as it was for me. I would like to uh, give back uh, the spotlight to Marek and Aisha so that they can talk about an overview and uh, updates uh, on, on uh, what, what next, what might be the next um, um, opportunities for this conversation to move forward and uh, result in practical uh, processes. Thank you. I, uh, thanks, Beth. So thanks so much, an amazing facilitation. And I love your summary of the discussion. Um, thanks so much. And, and, and really thank you for all the, those who participated in the breakouts, breakouts. I guess maybe I did put it in the chat, but I was, um, I was uh, referencing Louise's point in the breakout. I'm just going to reference it again and use my, the, the space I have right now to say, I think 5 billion per year isn't a bad shout to be asking for climate finance to go to local led adaptation. So, Maybe we'll be uh, we'll, we'll ask that in the other regional dialogues and see if other if see if others agree and we'll feed back and make sure everyone knows what has happened in the other dialogues. But um, could we be collectively asking for five billion per year? And I'll I'll get it into a moment and um, what that might we, how we can work together to maybe input it, that into the COP. So thank you all so much. This is the close of the second dialogue, Africa dialogue. Um, but this is not the end, and um, we will be doing various events on local led adaptation at the COP which you can engage in either physically if you're going to be there or there will be some virtual spaces. But I really want to incentivize you if you are interested, particularly country representatives to take forward and have discussions on how we can practically take forward approaches for local led adaptation, please do get in touch with the people at IID or WRI or any of the other partners involved. Um, because that's really the purpose of this is to really practically take forward and move beyond just discussion and really put this into practice and have a big ask for the donor community to really make these changes. Uh, Ebony, can we go to the next slide? Um, so just to say on how you can continue to stay engaged in addition to getting in touch if you'd actually like to have practical discussions on how we can take forward some of these ideas and some of these initiatives either to scale up or replicate. Just to say the COP is going to be incredibly busy, uh, COP26 in a few weeks time, but local led adaptation has got a crucial focus at the COP. So just to give you an overview of how you can stay engaged, on the 8th of November, the Adaptation Loss and Damage Day, um, we'll have a specific session focused on uh, local-led adaptation with voices from the front line on 9 a.m. till 10 a.m. on Monday, the 8th of November. So really incentivize you. I think some of you involved in this session will be represented and that is an opportunity to really feed in these asks for COP26. And so really incentivize you. If you've got further ideas, do get in touch and we can help connect these ideas and these asks to really get into the COP and even maybe the ministerial dialogue and adaptation action and the further events over the course of the presidency adaptation loss and damage day. There are four events as part of the Resilience Hub, um, including in it, sessions on local government, sessions on um, civil society pathways and gateways and gaps for local adaptation, and further opportunities to discuss what are the pathways and challenges for financing local led adaptation and an opportunity if anyone is interested to actually make an endorsement to the principles or has an announcement on increasing support for local led adaptation there'll be a session on the 8th of november on announcements a space for new announcements on local led adaptation initiatives there will also be a local led adaptation hub and there is an ongoing uh, um, EOI, so applications are being still accepted for the local-led adaptation hub. That's that green box. And finally, the Development and Climate Days will be doing two sessions, one on financing local-led adaptation in conflict-affected settings, and another one on what is that, responding to that question, what is the role of the private sector in supporting local-led adaptation? So that, I know there's a lot going on, so please do let us know. Please do pop in the chat as well. If you're doing any sessions or involved in any sessions on local led adaptation, we'd love to hear and help collate and share all that's going on on local led adaptation at the COP. And final slide, please, Ebony. And just finally, and ask if you are interested to endorse the principles and join the community of practice on local led adaptation, please do get in touch. Have a look at the principles either on WRI or IID's website. 
and we'd love you to join this growing number of 57 and more endorsements to the eight principles in joining this community practice we'd really really love you to join and to share and continue this discussion and also put pressure on your national governments on donors on other institutions to really endorse these principles and grow this movement and really make a step change in open adaptation so i'll finish then thank you so much thank you again beth for a fantastic facilitation and thank you all for participating thanks very much Thank you, everyone, and uh, have a lovely day wherever you are. And uh, yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to moderate this session. Bye bye. <laughs>